This episode of Ragcast Outdoors is brought to you by PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Fish on! Hey, Radcast is on! Hunting, fishing, and everything in between. This is Radcast Outdoors. Here are David Merrill and Patrick Edwards. And welcome to another episode of Radcast Outdoors. I'm your host today, Patrick Edwards, and I don't have my co-host, David Merrill, because he's at an archery shoot competition in Montana. But I have a very special guest co-host who you might remember. If you go back a few episodes, uh, we learned about his miserable trek through the Swiss Alps, but it was also one of the most beautiful treks that he's ever done. Um, He did 240 miles in 16 days. And then we had him on for another episode to talk about hunting mountain goats in the Hell's Canyon area of Idaho. And... He's been my friend for pretty much my entire life. Seth Ewing, thanks for co-hosting. Well, thanks for inviting me back. <laughs> I'm really excited about what we've got for everyone on this episode. Yeah, so it's it's been a lot of fun. Seth's been listening to the podcast and he's been a great resource as far as, you know, giving me feedback on it and also like, hey, here's an idea of somebody you could bring on and what was it? Probably about a year ago you had an idea for this guest or so, something like that. Yeah, I, that's probably about right. You start getting um, like Hall of Fame fishermen and stuff on if you're gonna if you're gonna swing for the fences. <laughs> I know one of the most popular things you do on the podcast is recipes, and so there's only one name in wild cookery that's really changed my whole outlook on it. And I mean, there are other guys who are worth doing, but Hank Shaw is the guy who like just paradigm shift completely when it came to how to process big game in particular. And he just, just released a fish cookbook and I've found it to be just as good. I've been eating fish my whole life and I'm still learning new things and he's really excellent. So why don't you tell a couple of stories about just how integral his <laughs> recipes have been in your life and some of the things you've used them for? Cause I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. So I know probably the the number one thing you're you're thinking about is the <laughs> the first thing that I cooked for my wife when we started dating was a Hank Shaw recipe, tangerine venison, which has continued to be one of our favorites. But you know, you've got a new new relationship starting, and you wanna wanna keep things going in a good direction. Good food's a good way to do that. So I drove my uh, my ingredients and my walk down hundred miles to where she lived and, uh, made that. And I think it was a hit because when, uh, we got married in December, she said like, we need to take the stuff to do that again on our honeymoon. So had the, through the walk in the car. And so that's just one of the things like, really, I kind of lapsed as a big game hunter from grew up with that wet deer hunting on my 12th birthday, as you do if your birthday's in hunting season. And, uh, but when I went off to college, like I was out of state, um, didn't have the resources financially to do out of state hunting or go back to Idaho. So, um, kind of just lapsed and didn't do it. And I also just had really kind of terrible memories of cleaning shanks for hamburger, taking out silver skin and just how awful and tedious that was. And, looking at Hank Shaw's bone in recipes for shanks and for necks and, and ribs, it made me excited to shoot deer again because of what I could do with it when I got it home. So I know you've got a coffee, coffee of buck, buck moose that, mm-hmm. uh, that I got for you and both of my brothers and some of my other hunting buddies too, pretty influential. And he's a big part of, he's a big part of the Ewing household in terms of our, what we have at the table. Yeah, just to talk a little bit about Hank Shaw, some of you may be like, man, I've heard that name before. Well, you probably have because he's very well known in the outdoor space as kind of the leading expert on cookbooks for fish, game, birds, all those things. Um, He's a James Beard Award winner, which if you're wondering what that is, that's basically like winning an Emmy or an Oscar. So that's, that's that's a big deal. Like he's recognized as the best at his craft, at his game. He's also got this podcast, Hunt Gather Talk. And 
it is so good. Like <laughs> it is an amazing podcast. I've been binging on it. Um, just a lot of great topics, you know, obviously right now he's doing like his fishing stuff. So of course I'm listening cause that's my game, but it is really interesting. He has a lot of great guests on people. You will definitely know from different sectors of the outdoor industry or maybe TV, you know, celebrity chefs, that kind of thing. So he's, he's got quite the reach that way. And then Seth, you know, if you could just talk about just some of the books that he's written and kind of what they're geared towards. Yeah. So I mentioned the, the first one that I became familiar with was Buck Buck Moose, which is a pretty comprehensive book on ev- what you can do with venison. He excludes buffalo or bison from that, puts it in a different category, but all of those deer or deer-like animals, he's gathered recipes from all over the world because everyone eats something like deer on whatever continent they're found. And so he's gathered all this information. He starts off the book with, and he does this with most of his books. He starts off with how to take care of that, that creature out in the field before you get it to the kitchen and then has it broken down into different, different kinds of cooking from, you know, roast and uh, all the way to the weird things, like what he calls the wobbly bits. Um, So things like tripe or, and different charcuterie. And it's really a great guide, but he's done the same kind of treatment for waterfowl and he's done it for a small game. And he just released his latest book, hook, line and supper that deals with all things from the water. It's you, you could call it a fish cookbook, but it really covers things like shellfish and seafood and just things you, you would you would capture in the water in general and gives it a really comprehensive treatment that will definitely expand your horizons even if you've been eating and cooking fish your whole life and if you haven't been to his website he's got so much there's like let's say you can't afford a cookbook right now which you should be able to afford there's like 25 bucks or something like that but like if you just want to check out the website and see if you know, it's worth your investment. If you're even interested in going that way, you should check out his website because it's got a ton of information that's just out there, not to mention his blog. Um, but I mean, there's venison recipes, rabbits, hare, squirrels, pheasants, doves, pigeons, wild pig, bear, and all kinds of fishing, charcuterie, wild, ed- wild edibles. Yeah. Gathering. So like mushrooms and all these other things, wild greens and herbs, acorns, nuts, starches, He's got all of that on the website. And so we're really excited to have this conversation with Hank Shaw. So we hope that you guys will sit back and relax and enjoy this conversation because it's going to be a lot of fun. Mr. Hank Shaw, welcome to the Radcast Outdoors podcast, man. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this has been a little bit of a long time coming. Uh, my buddy Seth, who is actually helping me co-host this, he he told me all about you and he sent me the book Buck Buck Moose, and that's how I got introduced to Hank Shaw recipes. And I remember the very first one I tried. I tried an antelope. Uh, I used the antelope, so pronghorn antelope from here in Wyoming, and I made a venison stroganoff, and it was uh, yeah. absolutely delicious. So I got a good introduction to you because I tried <laughs> a recipe that, that was excellent. That I, I have a love-hate relationship with that re- recipe because while it tastes amazing, I don't know if you've ever tried to photograph any kind of stroganoff, <laughs> but we went through six or seven de- iterations of that dish because it just was just ugly as homemade sin. <laughs> and, and so we just, we finally decided, oh, well, I'll make it on Spatzel. And then it finally looked good. And so, yay. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it, that is a tough one to photograph because my wife says it looks like dog throw ups, like typically, right? Like it just isn't. She's not very, wrong. It's, it's not visually appealing. So, no, it's the only thing worse that I can think of that people actually eat on, on the regular is biscuits and gravy. Yeah. That really yeah. truly is <laughs> dog vomit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally looks like that. But I'll tell you what, man, that was a delicious recipe. So I really enjoyed that. And then, of course, like the barbacoa and other things. I mean, it's it's a must have. But just so our audience gets to know you, I think a lot of people who listen to this show probably have heard of your work and have probably heard of your your cookbooks or, you know, your podcast. But if you could for just a little bit, just tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in, you know, procuring and cooking your own food. 
Sure. Uh, I'm from the East. and You might be able to hear it in my voice. Um, uh, I'm originally from New Jersey and I grew up um, in kind of a, it's kind of a, if you ever watch some of the 1980s shows or like uh, TV shows like 16 Candles or, or Ferris Bueller's Day Off, I, I grew up in a town like that, except I was on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, so it was kind of a, a poor kid in a rich town. And my mom is from New England. And, and so she was raised in a much more rural setting. And so what she brought to that suburban area that I grew up in was, was a, uh, the importance of knowing the names of things and knowing the names of all the plants around us and knowing the names of the animals around us. And, and that very quickly dovetailed into gathering wild plants and, and fishing. Uh, my mom is from Ipswich, which is right near Gloucester. And if you know anything about fishing, you should know that Gloucester is at, at one point, it was the number one fishing port in the, in the United States. And mm. uh, I think it's number two or three now behind Dutch Harbor. And, and uh, there's, there's a weird one in Virginia that only, you know, fishes for Menhaden, but that's a weird asterisk. Anyway, <laughs> um, I grew up fishing and, and gathering wild plants and, and berries and green things and mushrooms and all that sort of thing really from the time I was a tiny little kid, you know, there's pictures of me as a toddler eating raw clams and such. I didn't start hunting until I was about 32, which is now 20 years ago. Um, my, how time flies. <laughs> and I started it when I lived in Minnesota and a friend of mine who had been fishing with, he was the outdoor writer for the newspaper that we both worked for, which is the St. Paul pioneer press. He was the outdoor writer and I was an investigative reporter covering politics. And and so hunting seasons came around. He's like, yeah, man, we should go hunting. I'm like, oh, you know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pheasant hunt in South Dakota. And, and I had never shot a shotgun before. And so before we went out in the field, he threw up a whole bunch of milk jugs. And when I finally hit one with an over and under, he's like, all right, that's good. <laughs> and <laughs> needless to say, I didn't hit anything on that trip. But what was really interesting to me was uh, his ability to read land the way I could read water. Um, I'm, I'm mostly a saltwater fisherman. And so you need to know things about like underground structure, underwater structure and tides and seasonality and, and where the, what, what the weather is doing somewhere else, because it can affect where you are now. And there's, there's lots and lots and lots of things involved in fishing, both freshwater and salt that have nothing to do with a rod and reel and hunting is the exact same way. And it was those sort of intangibles that really attracted me to hunting. And I mean, not for nothing though, he had, he had, uh, he buttered me up with, by giving me things like pheasants and duck and, and venison. <laughs> and, you know, I knew how to cook these things because I was a chef, you know, I had graduated from high school and then in college I started to work in kitchens and I graduated to be kind of a low level chef. You know, I'm, I, I've never was like a chef de cuisine and I never owned my own restaurant or anything, but, but I, I've, I've got the pirate stories from, from the, to the back of the house. And, and so I did that for a while. So I'm, I, I, I'm trained as a chef and I know what to do. And, and I've eaten a lot of good food in my life. My parents, I so I'm the last of four and my mom and my stepdad really liked good food. And so when you only have the one kid, you could take the kid, especially if the kid likes good food to fancy restaurants. And, and like I said, I grew up in New Jersey, but I grew up in the part of New Jersey that's real close to New York. So I got to eat in some of the finest restaurants in new york when i was a little kid so for me venison and duck and and pheasant and quail and all of these things were high-end deals mm. like this is not poverty food like if you say venison i'm like oh sweet we're gonna have it like steak diane or we're you say duck we're gonna duck l'orange or, or and so there's uh, my in my mind game had always been associated with high class Lo and behold, apparently that's not true for everybody. <laughs> no. And and so when I finally got around to to actually writing about you know sort of my, the the career that I'm in right now, I was like I said I was a political reporter for 18 years, and I I started writing about food in general and wild food in specific as a way to stay sane, because mm. even even when I was still doing it, which is now I've been out of the game since 2008. Thank God. Um, but even in 2008, things were pretty ugly and they're just even more ugly right now. I'll put it this way. I got into that, that profession because politics used to be about the art of compromise. It used to be about debate and it used to be about how to get things done 
with people from differing backgrounds. Well, that that's no longer the case and hasn't been for quite some time. So when you have people who are very extreme on both sides of the ideological spectrum, they tend to just shout past each other. And if you're a journalist, it really doesn't matter what your politics are. That's boring because it's basically two sides saying you're a poopy head. No, you're a poopy head. And I'm like, you know, give me a break. This is terrible. I don't want to do this job anymore. So I started to write about food and I very quickly came to the conclusion that the thing I was best writing about was wild foods. So I started Hunter Angler Gardener Cook in 2007. And that website has been going strong since 2007. And it's now the the number one website in the world for wild food recipes. Uh, there's more than 1,500 recipes on it. And and it does well. It does well. It's the kind of the core of what I do. And that's, you know, that's huntgathercook.com is probably the easiest way to get to it. But but that is the fountain foundation of, of everything that comes out of it. And so, you know, I've got five cookbooks and got a podcast and da 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 da. Well, it's interesting um, to hear that because we were very curious about that part of how did that transition from just gathering things to writing about it because I've grown up around people who, you know, did all of those kinds of activities like picked morels or went fishing, but I don't know anyone who writes about it. So that's, that's really interesting to hear about. That's a very different skill set for sure. I'm just curious, like, as I've looked at some of your you know, like earlier writings, like uh, Duck, Duck, Goose, up to your current cookbook, because you're also not just doing the, the website, you've also got these books. How, how do you feel like you've grown as a, as a writer or communicating, you know, you grew up or you have that background as a professional working in kitchens and you're communicating to people like me who are that's not my background. That's not what I do, you know? So I'm curious, how have you evolved? Um, how would you see that you've evolved? I think the the fact of being a newspaper reporter really, really, really helps because uh, when I covered politics, I made certain that I had two editors. One editor was a political insider and the other editor could not care. So <laughs> when I would write a story it was important to be interesting to the editor who was a political insider, but understandable to the person who couldn't care less. And, and so that skill of being clear and being fast, by the way, uh, there are times where I've had to write three stories in one day to be clear and to be concise and to be quick and to largely be error free is an extremely important skill really in any kind of writing, but it's especially so with writing about, recipes for wild food. And here's why. <laughs> How many times have either you guys or anybody out there listening sent a text message where what you write is not what that person read? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> right? So, I mean, there's a lot of explaining to do after those texts. And <laughs> now imagine that I have a recipe for, oh, let's take a good one. Let's take like moose tenderloin. Right. So here's a, here's one of the crowning pieces of meat in the entire wild game world. And if my recipe, if what I write is not what you read in that recipe and, and, and you follow my directions and you ruin your moose tenderloin, you can't go down to the supermarket and get another moose tenderloin. I've just hosed you for what is probably the only, well, you might, you might have one other, but the only moose tenderloin you're ever going to get because it's typically a once in a lifetime tag. And yeah. so I live in constant fear of <laughs> someone like, I, here's the best example ever. I get these, I get something to this degree all the time, but this is the best one. About a year ago, it was during COVID, no, about a year and a half. So it was, it was in 2020. So during COVID, I got this long message and it, the, the writer was really clever because they, they, you know, she buried the lead. So she had me going for good six or seven graphs. Her husband died of COVID and her husband, as he was dying of COVID, this is, this is kind of later in 2020 where, where not everybody was stuck in a hospital and you could see each other. Mm -hmm. um, he's essentially his last meal. It wasn't his actual last meal, but it was his last meal that he, he was sort of conscious for it was one of my recipes. And, and thanks be to all that is holy 
it worked. <laughs> right? Could you imagine? Like, I would, I would never, ever, ever be able to live with myself. Like, yeah, you know, my husband who died of COVID, I made him your recipe for X and it sucked. So he died unhappy. I'm like, whoa, no pressure. <laughs> right. So, Yikes. yeah. So it's so that's a long way of saying uh, I take both. I take my job as a recipe writer very seriously, but especially in the books, because the books are static in the way that there are many people who buy my books who are not very uh, who are not aware that I'm on social media and not aware that I have a website. So what I say in the book is is iron in that case where lots of people know, like they'll find me on Instagram or, or my website and they'll be like, Hey, um, when you do this, do you mean that? And here's a good, another good example. Cause you, in, before we got on the air, you'd mentioned my barbacoa recipe. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much more clear I can be in the recipe uh, for that. And you guys are laughing. Cause I, you know exactly <laughs> where I'm going on this one. So it, I don't know how much more clear I can be. This recipe calls for one or two canned Chipotle's. <laughs> if I had a dollar for every time someone misread that as cans of Chipotle's, <laughs> I could eat at the French one. <laughs> That's so funny because my we just we actually just made that recipe, um, and I wasn't in charge of putting it together before work so we could have it for dinner. And my wife and I had that conversation. <laughs> it's like, how do we have enough for this? It's like it's not even the whole can. It's just a couple of them. It was like, <laughs> so we avoided the, uh, I probably would have liked it with more chilies, but she would not have. So, so many people are like, it's really good, but it's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> Spicy. I don't think it's supposed to be hot. <laughs> uh, no, it's, that's really funny. That is funny. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by high mountain seasonings. It's that time of year. If you're fishing, you're out in the field, you're catching a lot of fish, and you need some good fish brine to smoke up those trout fillets, you can go to highmountainjerky.com or himtnjerky.com. And it's also that time of year to stock up before hunting season. So if you need the absolute best jerky seasoning on the market, you can check out their jerky seasoning kits they're very easy to do, no matter whether you're doing whole muscle meat or ground jerky. They've got everything that you need. If you want to cook fish, like on a pan sear fish or cook duck or pheasant or whatever you're cooking, they have the seasoning for you. So again, go check out our friends at High Mountain. You can go to himtnjerky.com and check out all their different options. Now back to the show. You talked about I do want to touch on this a little bit. You talked about starting hunting at a much later age than like Seth and I, Seth and I started when we were really little and uh, we're seeing a lot more of that nowadays, right? Like a lot of people are starting to care more about where their food comes from. And I think you're part of that movement too, you know, where people want to harvest their own meat, you know, whether it's a ethical consideration for them or whatever it might be, you know, maybe they just want to make sure that they're getting something clean. That's why I do it. You know, I think it just tastes better and is cleaner, but, um, can you talk about, you know, just kind of what factored into being that long? Like, did you just not have other opportunities where you're not interested or what, what was the factor there? Yeah. I'm kind of the OG adult onset hunter. Like, like cause I came when I started doing this, you know, 20 years ago, um, nobody was like, I was, I was absolutely a unicorn. I was like a unicorn mm -hmm. wearing a skirt, rollerblading <laughs> through Harlem. Like, like yeah. <laughs> I, was a, I was the weirdest thing on the planet. And everybody's like, what are you doing? And, and hunters were like, who are you? And <laughs> it was, yeah, I was, I knew of literally no one else who had started hunting, um, as an actual adult. Like I knew some people who had started in college, but and, and so I kind of blundered my way through it, but the reason I did it was, and you mentioned a little bit of it, you know, I'm not a monk. If we go to a restaurant, I'm going to eat stuff, but I wanted to reduce my footprint in terms of my interaction with factory farms as much as possible. Mm. And so to that end, I started, you know, working around the edges, but not very far after, you know, so I started 2001, 2002 ish. By 2005, I stopped buying meat. 
and I haven't bought meat or fish for the household more than a handful of times since then. Now, I do have a couple of weaknesses. Um, I can't make all my own bacon. And <laughs> I've got a buddy who is a really, really good hog farmer. So I get heritage pork from my friends. I have two friends, one in Ohio and one in Michigan that, that do really good pork. Uh, so that's that's kind of a big, and, and oh, an octopus. Like I, have a, I, I can't live without eating octopus and um, they're fiendishly difficult to catch. I don't know if you've ever mm. tried, but they're like the Harry Houdini of creatures. And so <laughs> like they're hard to catch. So I buy them, but that's about it. And, and so that was a piece of it, but really, you know, again, swinging back to the fact that I always viewed this, these as luxury items. Um, <laughs> it was like the flavor, man. Like I get asked <laughs> about nutrition information all the time. Like, is this nutritious or healthy? I'm like, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. It tastes good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, That's how I answered about bacon. I'm like, who cares? <laughs> well, yeah. And you know, I'm, you know, I've, my blood, love, my blood work always comes out good and I'm not <laughs> overweight. And so I like, I, I've no, I mean, here's the thing, like a, a really good friend of mine's mom notes that fat doesn't make you fat. Eating too much makes you fat. So if you eat fatty things, eat less. It's not that hard, folks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, don't and then work, I got to work buddy. it off looking for bullets in the mountains. Um, or that. <laughs> Funny story about that. So another one of my friends, everyone calls her Butter. That's not her name. She wasn't, you know, it's not, this is a Butter on her license plate. But everyone but, loves Butter, though. Yeah. So it sounds promising. <laughs> so, so she lives in the Rockies. And every summer you get your monsoon rains, hopefully. And after that monsoon rain comes your, uh, you get boletus uh, rubriceps. So it's like the red capped bolete. It's like, it's not mm -hmm. really a porcini, but it's close and you might as well be one. So everybody who's interested in boletes scours the Rocky Mountains. Well, well, butter absolutely is <laughs> so obsessed with, with porcini that she was a, a professional forager. She would sell to restaurants, some of the best ones in Colorado. And she wouldn't sell porcini because she would eat them all. <laughs> but the only way that she could sustain herself through like 12 hour mushroom hunting trips is to eat butter sandwiches. So she would have pack yeah. herself in her backpack. Like, I don't know. I'd like to think it wasn't wonder bread, but some, some, some sinister part of me hopes it really was wonder bread. <laughs> and I, like wonder bread with like a stick of butter wrapped around it. And just like, <laughs> needed the, needed the fat, man. You got to have it. <laughs> She's up there 10,000 feet digging up porcini. Man, that yeah. would, that would be a heck of a calorie burn to be doing that on a regular basis. I mean, you'd be in amazing shape. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know if you guys pick mushrooms in the Rockies, but, but it doesn't last long up there. Like it's your, your flushes are only like 10 days. So like you're using every one of those 10 days. It's like a short gun season for deer. <laughs> yeah. We, this spring was uh, unusual in that we had a pretty long, pretty long mushroom deal this season. But yeah, like last year, it just morels barely happened last year because of the conditions. So it can be really skinny. We smoked sure. them this year. Yeah. Well, and I actually literally smoked some morels this year, which, boy, that's good. <laughs> How do you keep them lit? <laughs> um, I know, like, I don't even know where to go with that. <laughs> Very challenging. You need a blowtorch. Uh, uh, over here, we out, there was this uh, postcard company called Duck Boy Postcards, and they had a guy lighting up a, a white fish with a blowtorch and smoking it. <laughs> You know, like, that's all a, I can think of right now. There's a relative of the white fish called a hooligan. It's a, uh, it's also called, also called a Ushalon, um, also called a candlefish because when you dry it, it's so oily, you can light them on fire. That's scary. <laughs> it's like a, a Pacific <laughs> Northwest thing. So do they catch a fish similar to that up in Alaska? Cause I think I remember when I was in Anchorage as a kid, they were talking about a fish like that, that runs in like April mm -hmm. or May or something. Absolutely. Like that. That's the same fish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were Hooligans like Hooligans or Ushalon or Candlefish. Yeah, they were like, Yeah, you can light them on fire. And I was like, What? You can light a fish on fire? They're like, They're so full of oil, you can light them on fire. <laughs> like, that's that's disturbing, but all right. <laughs> but I mean, there's I'm gonna segue right into my next topic. But I mean, there are fish with really high oil content, right? Like, so like I think of lake trout. I just did a lake trout trip to Flaming Gorge, what was that, like a month ago or so. 
And I mean, they have a ton of oil in them, but they're so good to eat. And I was listening to one of your podcasts and you guys were talking about the unloved fish and uh, fish people don't like. So you have like the rough fish category or trash Mm -hmm. fish or whatever you want to call them. And then you have kind of on the other end of the spectrum, like here in Wyoming, you know, trout are revered obviously for fly fishermen. Or if you're going after giant lakers and flaming gorge, you love giant lakers. Like people are fanatic about lake trout um or you know walleyes perch crappie like those are the fish that are revered right and then on the other end of the spectrum you've got the sucker you've got the carp you've got catfish things like that and so i thought it was interesting listening to you talk about that with some of your guests and talking about how you know some of these fish get a really bad rap and and a lot of it comes down to people just flat out haven't even tried them ever and um, I know I did an experiment a couple of years back. Seth will remember me telling this story and remember this pretty well, but I actually had caught a carp while I was walleye fishing. And I looked up, you know, which portions I could take out that didn't have a whole bunch of bones in them and I could make them in a similar way. Cause I wanted to, I really wanted to test it out cause I hadn't tried it either. I was like, I want to try this and see if it's any good. And I fed it to people. They didn't know it was carp but they thought it was walleye. Like they didn't really know any difference. Done Which is kind of hilarious. Cause it, I can't think of two fish more different in fresh water. <laughs> and I did it with sucker <laughs> and same thing. They just <laughs> ate them. Right. That it's like, it's battered and fried, whatever, you know, like it was no big deal. Um, but I wanted you to talk about that just a little bit because like in my family, my kids, especially one of their favorite fish to eat is a bourbon. And I mean, mm-hmm. bourbon are ugly. They're nasty in some ways. Like if I've grabbed them and the, you know, you catch them at night and I grab them and they wrap around your arm. Like that's a little unnerving sometimes, you know, if you've I'll never had that experience, it. you know, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I take people fishing for them and they're like, what is that? And I'm like, that is one of the best tasting fish you'll ever eat in freshwater. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, why rough fish or trash fish, whatever you want to call them, get a bad rap and kind of some of the best ones and some of the best ways to maybe prepare them and enjoy them if someone ever wanted to actually step out of their comfort zone and try it. Sure. Um, to start with, with burbot or lawyer or ling or Mariah or eel pout, Mm -hmm. it's all the same fish. Uh, it's the only freshwater cod of eating size. There is, to my knowledge, there are two species of freshwater cod. One of them doesn't grow more than two inches long. And then there's the burbot. So I used to catch burbot or their cousin, called uh, a cusk and so in the north atlantic where i you know jersey and new york and, and new england there's this ground fish that lives right alongside the codfish called a cusk which is identical to a burbet so when i first caught them in minnesota i'm like woohoo and everybody else like you're insane i'm like you're <laughs> stupid and, <laughs> and uh, i mean even the cree indians that i fished with in manitoba they didn't want to eat them and they would they segregated me like we did, we did shore lunch and they, they cooked the pike and they wouldn't let me cook my burbot in the same pan as their, as their pike. And I'm like, all right, you sorry. <laughs> and so I, so I did my own, uh, so I did my own and everybody loved it, of course, cause it's bourbon. It's great. Um, so I, I think the stigma on burbot is falling away pretty quickly. There, the biggest reason why there's a bunch of other fish that people don't really like, I think the mechanical reason is that a lot of them have an extra set of bones. Mm-hmm. And yeah. if you are not familiar with fish that have an extra set of bones, then you, you can be confronted with you know, a fillet that's not actually a fillet. Shad's a good example. Um, the suckers are herring, uh, uh, whitefish. Um, uh, carp, carp is another mm-hmm. buffalo fish, moon eyes. Um, so all of these fish have that extra set of wire bones, and shad, of course, have two extra sets of wire bones. The old, the old native uh, story about shad is that shad used to be a porcupine, and he was a disgruntled porcupine. He was, he was a porcupine who just really deeply didn't like his life, and so he was whining and moaning and moaning and whining. And finally, the great spirit was like, "All right, enough of this." turned him inside out and made him a fish. And he says, are you happy now? And he said, yes, I'm a shad. <laughs> I like so, that. 
think that might have happened with some carp too. Um, <laughs> but even then, they're not. They're not. They might have been hedgehogs because they're not quite <laughs> as, as bony as shad. I think that's the biggest thing is is the mechanical reason of that, and people just don't know how to navigate around them. But I'm trying to think of. Let's see. Are there? Oh yeah, there's a another another fish that nobody likes is uh is the freshwater drum, the sheep's head. Right. And that fish gets hated on all the time. And there's no extra bones in that. And I don't understand that at all. Like I think I do I, it's in the, the same teeth. sense that people hate antelope. Well, it's the teeth too. Like I oh, think come on. I think it's the kisser <laughs> on them. Like the the guys who've been catching trout and walleye, they're like, Oh, this this fish has some funny looking mouth, you know. Like yeah. I think there is some of that because they're like fish racists. Like, something on, right guys. i know but like <laughs> to your point though like drum or i mean they're more oily but they are really yeah. good to eat like they're excellent fish i, I love so them funny because they're oily because you can smoke them what's so funny about drum to me is uh my family moved from southeastern wyoming up to on the missouri river and in, in montana and no one told us that they weren't good to eat so we didn't know any better and just we catch them and eat them <laughs> Like they're great. Exactly. I mean, so nowhere, nowhere are any drum of any, any species of drum hated on except in the Midwest, upper Midwest. I mean, I just, I just spent a fair amount of money on a charter chasing the world's largest drum in Southern California, the California white sea bass. It's, it's in the drum family. And I caught uh, something around a 41, 42 pounder, which is a big, big sea bass Mm -hmm. and and you know like they're amazing and i've 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 tried to catch this for years and i finally caught one and everyone's like yay and and you go to the (laughs) gulf of mexico and like there's all kinds of drum and everyone's like yay you go to louisiana and even freshwater drum is like yay but as soon as you get to st louis they're like oh this is trash (laughs) like i don't get it (laughs) i don't get it either like i don't know if it's again i don't know if it's just a certain look to a fish or you know, you I had- think it's this. So like antelope, antelope and, and freshwater drum go bad in a hurry. Mm. So if you're, if you don't have best practices on your boat or on the shore and you catch a freshwater drum, the meat will be mushy. So I have always, always caught a fish, either stuck my finger in his gills and popped the gills or, or, or cut them with a knife and thrown them in some water and let them bleed out. And then I'll put them on ice since I was like, I don't know, 10 years old. And, and so if you do that, they're perfectly good. But if you let a drum get warm after it's dead, it will get mushy. I mean, it's just, it's the same thing with antelope with people are like, well, antelope's terrible. <laughs> well, usually the way that the traditional antelope hunt is like, okay, the three of us are antelope hunting, right? So Seth shoots his antelope first light, drills it. Then about an hour later, you know, you, Pat, you shoot one. Perfect. <laughs> I can't buy an antelope. And it's like, I don't know, four or five, six hours later. It's like two o'clock in the afternoon. I finally get my antelope. Okay. Now we start gutting all three of them. So mine's fine. Yours mm-hmm. are terrible. <laughs> yeah. Ours, you don't even want to feed to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, I, I, that's how people traditionally hunt them. Hopefully that's yeah. changing, but, but I've seen that scenario over and over again. And people wonder why they're gross. Yeah. We've, on our show, we've really tried to change that because, like, like I told you on our like introductory calls, like, man, you shoot them in ninety degree heat, right? right? Like, it is hot, and if you don't get that puppy on ice quick, it just it just tastes disgusting. It's just it's super gamey, I guess is what you'd say, but mm-hmm. like, it just gets this foul taste because it's starting that decomposition. It's getting gross, like, really quick, and and I'm glad you brought that point up about fish too like what are some best practices like if i if i catch a fish whether it's a freshwater drum a walleye trout doesn't matter what's the best practice that every angler should know if they're going to take them home and eat them Mm -hmm. i think on my tombstone it's going to say things like pluck the bird don't cry in the shanks and bleed the fish i like it (laughs) <laughs> bleed, the, bleed the fish like number one bleed the fish number two bleed the fish like it's not hard if with small fish use your fingers with bigger fish use a knife um for those of you out there in grouper land do not try to pop your grouper's gills with your fingers you'll lose your finger um 
tin snips are really good if you catch really large fish. But for the freshwater world, by and large, your fingers are fine. They have to bleed into water. You can't pop gills and put them on something. They won't bleed out. I mean, a little bit, but not really. So if freshwater, you put them in a bucket of freshwater or you put them on a stringer in freshwater. Watch out for the turtles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if you're in salt water, you do the same thing. You either put them in salt water or you put them on a stringer. Watch out for the seals. So that's number one. Number two is have ice on the boat. Ice is your friend until it's not. The, the exception to ice is your friend is ice fishermen. So ice fishermen have this bad habit of like, eh, yeah, I caught this. I'm up there by the thing, you know, and I caught these crappy and they threw these crappy out on the ice and they're frozen solid. Well, duh, right? They're frozen solid. And then now you have to thaw them to fillet them. And then that's fine if you don't freeze them again. But then if you freeze them a second time and then you thaw them a second time, you're like, why are they all watery and mushy? Well, well that's why. Yeah. So that's a terrible idea. Like if, it, if you're catching more fish on the ice than you think you can catch before you have to freeze them, don't let them freeze that first time. It's not that hard. Mm -hmm. You're in an ice shack. And if you're not on an ice shack, you should be in an ice shack. Yeah. Well, and like you mentioned, like, obviously I think your best case scenario there is if you've got a boat and your boat is carrying your cooler of ice or whatever, like, um, I've done a lot of my fishing roving around streams and rivers and mm -hmm. things. You can still um, bleed them and put them on a stringer. Yeah. Is that because I, it's funny, my family and Pat's too, I know we were all really fanatical about how we cared for our red meat, um, keeping it clean, keeping it cold. But we were totally guilty of that. Having the trout on a forked stick. I think, uh, when you wrote, when you wrote about it, just putting the analogy of saying that's like shooting a deer on a 130 degree day and not cleaning it. It's like, Oh, we weren't very careful with our trout. <laughs> <That's laughs> I mean, why they, you, that's why they were nasty. <laughs> sometimes you can get away with it. Like, I mean, it's cold in Wyoming sometimes. So, I mean, if it's 50 degrees out, yeah, I mean, you can probably get away with it a little bit, but if you're fishing, I mean, I've seen people fish in Wyoming when it's 85, 95 degrees out. Yeah, it's you. If, if it was me, I'd want an ice cold beer anyway. So, <laughs> so you bleed a fish, put it on a string. Here's what you do: you get one of those. So, okay, I'm going to preface this by saying Yeti doesn't pay me, uh, <laughs> but Yeti makes this this awesome uh, cooler backpack, and I'm sure some other companies make cooler backpacks, mm -hmm. uh, but I have one from Yeti. And so, put your you know, you catch your trout, bleed your trout, put it on the stringer. Okay, it's blood out. Well, you've got your, you should have your Yeti backpack full of ice and beer. So put the fish in and take a beer out and then just keep yeah. going back and forth until there's only fish. There you go. I mean, that's all you got to do, right? You just rotate them. We used to do that with crabs in Long Island. So like we'd be crabbing off the dock and we'd have a case of beer in the cooler. And I can, I can assure you by midday when there's more crabs than beer, in the cooler, getting those last 12 beers was extremely difficult. <laughs> there's, 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 there's three or four dozen angry blue crabs trying to get you. Yeah, I'll bet that would be a little sporty uh, sticking your hand in there. But yeah, I, I think, you know, Seth talked about it. You know, when we were younger, we would, we would catch fish, throw them on the stringer and not think twice about it until we got them home to, to clean them and do whatever. And I know about I don't know, maybe it was seven or eight years ago, I read an article in InFisherman by Doug Stange, and he was talking about bleeding fish and just the difference in the quality of your fish and then, of course, icing your fish too. And I caught some suckers um, a few years ago, and I actually tested that theory on, I mean, these were some pretty good-sized white suckers, and some of them were bled, some of them weren't, and then I, you know, filleted, off the fillets just to look at the meat and see the difference. And there's clearly a difference between the ones that are bled and the ones that aren't. And people are like, no, no, there's not. And I, I took a picture. I'm like, uh, yeah, there is. Look at this. Like it's totally different looking meat. Like one was really pink in color. One was more light in color. Yep. Um, and, and, and your, your cutting board's all bloody. Like mm -hmm. I did this, I did this exact same test with uh sheep's head in the Gulf of Mexico and they're kind of a porgy. And so they're a white fish. So more fishermen get the idea of uh, bleeding things like trout or salmon or tuna or jacks or mackerel or bluefish. They, they kind of understand that a little bit more because they're, they're not a, a, a flaky white fish. 
they, they somehow think that flaky white fish don't have blood and, and, and it's true. They're not as bloody and nasty as like, I mean, it, you know, there's a reason why you wear rubber outfits when you tuna fish, because it's, I mean, it looks like good fellows on the back of the boat. And, <laughs> and, and so there's super bloody fish, but, but even a regular old, you know, walleye, we just did it with walleye actually. Um, and in Michigan, and that was even noticeable. I think it's often overlooked. I mean, it just really is like people just don't think about it. And then they, and then, you know, I've met a lot of people, they say, well, I grew up and I didn't like fish. Like I hate fish. <laughs> and I try to convince them to try something that I've cooked and they're like, nope, can't do it. I hate fish. And then somehow I, you know, coerce them into having some fish and they're like, oh, that's really good. And it's like, well, when you take care of it and you prepare it well, then it's going to be really good. And you just probably had a really bad experience. Yeah. I mean, one of the bad experiences I have and what a lot of people had too, I write about this in Hook, Line, and Supper, which is my fish book, um, is my mom, we used to catch just buckets of flounder, of winter flounder or summer fluke, and just buckets of them. And mom would always make fried flounder. It was sort of breaded and fried, and then she would make it with tartar sauce. Well, she would, I mean, like I said, we caught buckets, right? So she would, see, she would fry up, I don't know, like eight pounds of flounder. <laughs> and, and when she was done, everyone would, would, you know, stab each other to get the, the four or five ones that are on top because the ones on the bottom are absolutely disgusting because <laughs> they've been, they're sure they were fried, but now they're like steamed and mushy and the paper towels all glued to them. And it's, oh, it's the worst. <laughs> And, and then when I've worked in a restaurant where we fried things like, and we would hold it in a, in a low oven on a baking sheet on a rack. So there was air circulation around it and it was still hot and it would, it would keep for like, it would keep for like an hour. And then if it was after an hour, we'd throw it in the fryer for like, I don't know, a minute and it would crisp back up. Mm -hmm. So it was like, Oh, <laughs> and so like for, for all of you out there who like fried fish, if you don't know, as you're frying fish, turn your oven to warm or 200 degrees. I like 200 degrees. I like it actually hot, put a baking sheet in the oven, put a cooling rack on the baking sheet. As you fry fish, put them on the, the rack and then keep frying. And then when you're done, a, all your fish is hot. B it stays crispy and doesn't get mushy and gross. And that simple little thing could change someone's life. <laughs> yeah. It, it's like it the does. swipper. Yeah. <laughs> or if you're like me, you're consuming it as, as it's coming out of the fryer, well, right? <laughs> like, it's like one for you, one for me. <laughs> I'm guilty as charged. I like doing that. I like All the walleye cheeks don't yeah, make it. They don't make it. <laughs> well, that's fair. I mean, you're cooking. And I'm catching. I'm like, hey, I caught it. I cleaned it. I get the cheeks, but. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. Halibut <laughs> cheeks out here in the West. That's the same way. Like, mm -hmm. No one gets them, but me. <laughs> well, we've already kind of gotten adjacent to, you know, like some of the, some of the last things that I know I wanted to cover with you. And one of those is just, if you're introducing wild, wild food to someone who's new to it, um, what have you found to be the best ways to go about doing that? Cause it sure seems like people have expectations for meat in particular that are really based on what they get at the grocery store in terms of the kind of uh, beef, pork, and chicken they get at the grocery store mm -hmm. and wild meat isn't that. Um, but I think we would all agree. Like if, if you never experienced some of those wild things, like you're really missing out. It's not a, it's not a neutral thing you're missing out on. But how do you, how would you go about introducing, and I'm assuming you've done that tons and tons, introduce right. people to new culinary horizons? Well, I think there's a couple of ways to go about this. The first thing that we have to differentiate is you're not me. So I get a lot of leeway with people. Like I've served, pe served people like crickets and bugs and stuff. And they're like, okay, fine. Because <laughs> they know I'm going to make it taste delicious. And, they, and they're willing to do that trust fall with me. Until you have an audience that is willing to do uh, a trust fall with you, the easiest way is grind it with pork, pork fat or, or beef fat and make a ground meat thing, whatever that thing is, burgers or spaghetti sauce or chili or blah, 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 because you just can't taste it. Like, unless it's, <laughs> unless it's an absolutely ruined deer <laughs> or, or the most testosterone laden pig you ever shot. 
Um, it's gonna apparently be like, ah. my antelope. Or your antelope. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be like, yeah, it's chili. That's yeah, a burger. <laughs> You know, uh, so that's that's by far the safest way is to grind it with some domesticated fat and then go from there. But that's not really introducing them to wild game. That's just getting them to eat eat the matter. It's like the here's this protein that you're going to eat, and it happens to be semi wild source. I think the um, the easiest way, the kind of the gateways, are well trimmed backstrap and the breasts of birds skinned breasts of birds because um the skin adds an enormous amount of flavor and character and awesomeness but if you're squeamish or you don't know you know and you're you're like i don't know um (laughs) what we perceive of as awesomeness they might perceive it's different (laughs) and and it is it is in fact different because with rare exceptions um wild animals are older they are more athletic they're leaner they're tougher and they're denser so all of these factors figure into the expectation it's very similar to 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 switch gears a little bit if you've ever out there tried to make wine with the wild grapes that live near you and you made this wine and you gave it to anyone who drinks normal wine they were going to squinch their nose up and be like it's it's okay it's terrible (laughs) and it's only terrible because you think it's wine from grapes and technically it is wine from grapes but it's not really wine it is a it is a wine made from a wild berry so it's almost better to just not call it wine just to call it something else give it a name like you know you know purple junkadoo and <laughs> and serve it to them and they're like oh junkadoo is amazing uh, <laughs> but if you call it red wine they're gonna be like this is disgusting so it's expectation so mm-hmm. if you serve uh say a skin on a great example would be a skin on canvas back duck a skin on canvas back duck is one of the greatest things you're ever going to eat in the wild game world it's amazing but it tastes like a wild duck in a good way so it's not fishy, it's not pondy, it's just, it's just, but it's, it's, there's a flavor to it that is not based on corn, which every store bought animal is fed on. Mm-hmm. All of our store bought animals are finished on typically corn. And corn has a very specific flavor profile. So when we feed them something that is not, that was not eating corn, it's going to be different. So removing the skin, removing the fat is a way to neutralize the character of any kind of, uh, of meat. Like I've served, I have served, uh, whiny duck snobs, uh, skinned scoter breasts in a, like a stir fry. And they're like, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, it's surf scoter. And they're like, ah, oh, no, it's terrible. Now. Like, <laughs> so we're, we're far enough inland. Is that, would that be the equivalent of feeding duck. someone a coot? Okay. Yeah. There we yeah, go. It's like merganser level. They're tough. They're challenging, but if you get rid of the fat, they're fine. So yeah. So if you were to do like, a Chinese Chinese food is a great equalizer. If you're good at Chinese food, like you know velveting and you know how to do a stir fry, because the Chinese never eat anything rare. There's nothing mm. rare in Chinese food. It's always fully cooked, uh, and it's often marinated in things that remove odor. The Japanese do this too with sake. Mm. Um, it neutralizes a lot of the meats. Uh, thus, the old racist jokes about Chinese restaurants. Um, but you could do like, I have done uh, pheasant or, or skinless duck or skinless goose or, or venison in Chinese food uh, dishes. And they're virtually impossible to tell the difference. So that's another way. Another way is to just like fajitas. Who doesn't like fajitas? You know, like you could do a pheasant breast fajita. You could do venison. I mean, you could do venison backstrap fajitas and that's fine. But I, I always almost always do it with flank. And it, like, those are ways where just like, it's a comfortable dish. So that's the, that's the third and, and probably the most important thing. So like that stroganoff dish that we opened with, I would be surprised. Like maybe Seth, maybe your, your, your infamous, infamous pronghorn might be the exception. But in most cases, <laughs> if you made, you know, deer meat stroganoff and you made it right with full cream and, and, you know, it, it's, it's, people are going to be like, this is amazing because it's, it's a dish that they are comfortable with so that where you get people 
is if it's got the skin or fat on, if it's a bird or something like that, and if it's a weird dish to them. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by PK Lures. If you're like me, you're probably out on the water pursuing your favorite fish this time of year. Open water season is the most fun for me, and I always have PK Lures in my tackle box ready to go for my fishing trips. Some of the ones that I would recommend for this time of year, the PK spin a jig. If you're a jig fisherman, it's a must have. It adds extra flash to your jig. You can tip it with anything you want and it is downright effective for trout, walleye, panfish, and bass. The other thing I'd recommend is if you like to troll, there's a lot of options for that as well. My kids and I have done really well on the Ridgeline crankbait this season. We've caught a ton of different trout and also a lot of walleye. So that's a great option as well. If you like to troll crawler harness type options, the PK Wobbler and PK Dakota Disc have always been a go-to bait for me. So you can check all these out and much more at pklure.com. Again, pklure.com. Back to the show. So it sounds like a lot of what you're saying is like, it, it just, there's a level of which like, care about the person you're feeding this to. Think about what, what they're going to be comfortable with and then, you know, meet them more than halfway is what it sounds like. A lot of what you're saying boils down to in the end, like give them a good, you know, like a cut of meat that they're going to not find challenging yeah. um, served in a way that's going to be appealing. Um, but it's amazing. Like, I don't, I don't know if it's ego or if it's just like I have some kind of perverseness in our nature, but it's so easy to not do that for people. So like, I don't want to kind of, there's, I mean, there's two things that go on because I feel them as well as so you're not alone. Um, <laughs> part of it is a little bit of chest thumping. Look what I can do. And, and part of it is like, hey, 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 delete this. <laughs> that was me and, with the carp. I mean, I, admittedly it's, it's, you it's know, Pat's carp. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, yeah. I mean, Pat's carp. One of the greatest things you can do is like, <laughs> you just ate <laughs> venison testicles and like, <laughs> and you know, everyone's like, that was amazing. And then the one person's like, Oh my, mm -hmm. but so, I mean, that's, those are fun moments and you want to have those moments and I, and I get it. But if you're introducing someone <laughs> like save the weird bits for like the sixth or seventh time that person's eaten that, that meat. Um, like I, I served um, a Neapolitan, it's like a spicy tomato sauce, but with venison tripe. It's in actually, it's actually in Buck Buck Moose. Um, it's the sportiest recipe in that whole book. And I go over actually how to make tripe out of wild, wild cervids. Um, it's sporty, the short version. Um, you need a hose. Uh, <laughs> and, but I, I grew up with tripe cooked that way. So for me, that dish was very familiar and it tasted exactly how it should. And it was, it's, it's amazing. I love this dish. I recognize no one is ever going to make this dish. <laughs> like in, in duck, duck goose, I have a recipe for crispy fried duck tongues and yes. I get it. No one is going to make this dish, but if you do, it's amazing. The that's problem it. with me, I want, that's one I've actually really wanted to try just because of how weird it is, but I don't get <laughs> enough ducks to make that worth <laughs> Worth doing. you do need to whack a few dozen ducks every year like and they got to be decent ducks too like so we really only use the tongues from like gadwall on up but you're yeah, in like kind of mallard green country, wings so you're in, Ma in your mallard country so your mallards would be fine and of course yeah. canada geese would be too mm -hmm. oh yeah so i i know we're kind of getting to the point where we could talk to you all night, I think, but I did, Pat was telling me he had talked to you a little bit about the fact that you had foraged and gotten to, you know, go after things with feathers and fins and, you know, big game all over the place. I wondered, what would you say are some of the, like, for our area, kind of that Rockies, the Intermountain West, what are some of the most um, underutilized or kind of forgotten about wild things you can eat and i'm thinking kind of critters and plants like what are some of the things that people should really keep an eye out for or, or try um and what are some of the things you might do with those you know kind of thinking that idaho wyoming colorado well um, i think the first thing that springs to mind are the abert squirrels in colorado so they're the squirrels that look like batman um and 
you can hunt them. There's a season in, in, in Colorado and they're delicious. They're an amazing squirrel. Um, I think it's hard because the hunting culture in that region is so strong. There's not a lot of, you know, looked down on species. I mean, I know for every time, everything that comes to mind, it's like, Oh, I know 15 guys. that hunt that like, like sage grouse or blue grouse or, mm-hmm. or snowshoe hares or, or truckers or, um, <laughs> so I, I don't, it's hard to really say that those are underutilized. I think if you go to the, the fish realm, you have whitefish in some of these high lakes mm-hmm. and whitefish is, is one of the best fish in America to smoke. So good. And, and it's, there are vanishingly few freshwater fish that are worthy of this good smoke because they're just so lean, but the whitefish is one of them. Lakers are another. I don't really count Lakers as Intermountain West because they're not from there, but they live there. So that's fine. So you, by the way, you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that some fish with lots of flat fat in them, mm-hmm. there's a particular, it's called a Sisawet and is a particular subspecies of lake trout that lives only in Lake Superior that can be 50% fat by weight. Jeez. It's just insane. It's like a barrel of oil. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <Wow>. grill it. <laughs> yeah, you'll start a fire in your grill for sure. Holy smokes. Uh, Plant-wise, I think Yampa. Yampa would be my number one thing that like very few people know about Yampa. It's, uh, there's a bunch of species, but it is a, it's, it's in the carrot family, so you got to know your stuff. Um, the carrot family, by the way, um, carrot family is like amanitas with mushrooms. So some of the greatest mushrooms to eat in, in the world are amanitas. Also some of the most deadly mushrooms in the world are amanitas. Same thing with the carrot family, which is the parsley, carrot, dill, fennel, that kind of thing. Um, yamp is in that family. And so it's very easy to identify. It's not a very big plant and it grows in huge clumps and underneath the ground are, um, is a tuber and the tuber is about maybe a really big one would be the size of your pinky, but usually they're the size of like, you know, one and a half, two digits of your finger. And they are amazing. They're amazing. They're carrot like, and they're delicious. So that would be one people know about porcini quite a bit. So I don't think that's really underutilized and morels. Of course, I think, I mean, there's so many wild, edible plants but i'm trying to think of like special rocky mountain ones well and i I think too like just the focus of like none it's like awesome to get native species but obviously like one that's really underutilized here is not a native is the like just carp um we did we smoked up some carp and did the vietnamese smoked fish salad i've been looking for years for something that i would enjoy carp in just where it wasn't a pain picking around the crazy bones and everything and i like i found it that was it was it was amazing so you know yamp uh yampas you said yeah y-a-m-p-a so that's a good one you guys have a really cool sweet sicily in the goraki mountains there's four different species and the sweet sicily sounds like a country singer um (laughs) but sweet sicily is a very small woodland plant that what you really want to get are the the green seedlets and you get them in like may and june it's very it sits seeds very early but they taste like like a licorice bomb Hmm. like you can walk through the woods in like utah and colorado and wyoming and then you'll see it and you pick it and you just chew on it and it's like it's like eating breath mints so it's really super cool i mean a lot of people know about the currants that grow there there's some really excellent rocky mountain currants yep Pine nuts, pine nuts. This is the south part of the Rockies. Like, mm-hmm. so there are there's two pine nuts. There's Pinus monophylla, and then there's Pinus edulis. And so Pinus monophylla is my that's my local pine, good pine nut, and and that it goes from California to Idaho, and then edulis, which is the typical pine nut that you'd see with the Navajo. Um, that one's a bit more south, but it does get into Colorado. So I don't believe either live in Wyoming. So you guys are out of luck, but but. The greater region has quite a bit of them. Uh, oh, sand, and when you get to the plums, uh, the sand plums, there's just buckets of sand plums once you get out of the actual mountains and into the the, the front range. I'm, I'm not even, you know, it's funny. Like I lived in uh, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho almost my whole life. And I've, I'm not even familiar with that plant. I'm just like, I, I'm going to have to look it up. <laughs> there are a bunch of really good Rocky Mountain 
foraging and edible wild plants guides. And I, you know, I, I, I'm looking at my library right now and I probably have, I don't know, 100, 120 different edible wild plants books. And I think I've got a good half dozen to eight that are just about the Intermountain West. So people, there's the data is out there. And one of the cool things that if you really want to do and get into this stuff, um, look up the ethnobotanies of the indigenous groups from your region. So clearly there were lots of people here before Europeans showed up. Mm -hmm. So in the starting about the late 1800s and all throughout the 1900s, the, the scientists would try to figure out, well, okay, how did this group or that group use all the edible plants uh, in their area? And so they cataloged all of them. So they, there are these great, great books about the Paiutes and the Shoshones and, and the Flatheads and all that kind of stuff. And, and like they would use all of these plants in X amount of ways. Well, they've been there a minimum of 14,000 years, or at least if not, they have, somebody's been there and, and whoever, because, mm -hmm. you know, different native groups did move. So, but somebody's been there <laughs> for quite a long time. So they have a lot of knowledge built up on what's good and what's not. And so that you can learn a lot by listening to the natives. Yeah, there's a, so we have the Wind River Indian Reservation here in the Eastern Shoshone. There's a elder there that I was talking to and he was telling me how they utilize choke cherries because choke cherries are extremely plentiful here and on this side of the wind river range and he was talking about that and how they would take it and they would basically grind it into kind of like a paste and then dry mm -hmm. it and then eat it you know and they yeah. would they would also take like animal fat and add to it and just different things it was really interesting i was like oh that makes sense like it's it's That's basic pemmican. well yeah it's it's pemmican it's like it's kind of like our modern day you know, energy bars kind of concept. I mean, you're just basically grinding up this, this berry and then adding some protein fat elements to it and consuming it. And it's really good for you. But I did want to circle back to something you talked about, because you talked about whitefish and I smoked some whitefish a couple of years ago and some grayling. And I swear it was the best smoked fish I've ever had. Like it was really, really good. And I had people that were just trolling me about it. They said, Oh, I can't believe you would eat something like that. Like what are you thinking? Like those, those are nasty fish. And I was like, man, what are you talking about? This was some of the best smoked fish I've ever had. And, and they thought I was crazy. So they do have a different flavor profile and it's, it is a, it's just a little bit different, right? It's not just like your basic rainbow trout or salmon, but can you talk a little bit about the difference and maybe the difference in flavor? I mean, it's just, I'm shaking my head over here because you know, if you grew up where I grew up in the Northeast, smoked whitefish is in every Jewish deli from, you know, Boston to, to DC. And like I, a breakfast or a lunch that I would frequently have in junior high school and high school. It's like, if I was tired of sandwiches or Chinese food or subs, I would walk over to the Jewish deli and buy a whole whitefish, a chub, right? You know, it's about, I don't know, 10, 12 inches long. So you, they'd be stacked up in the Jewish deli. You buy a whole whitefish, and you get a little tub of, of Jewish mustard and you sit on the, on the corner and just eat that whitefish with mustard. Like, that's the thing. Like everybody does it. And it's, it's just, it's blowing my, my, my mind that people are like, Oh, you can't eat whitefish. I'm like, <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> um, so the reason why we love them so much is because they're oily and greasy and awesome. And so the reason why all the best smoked fish in the world are fatty is because smoke adheres to, to fat much better than it does to lean muscle. So, which is why smoked pork is better than smoked venison, and, which is why smoked whitefish is better than smoked walleye. Because if you were to smoke walleye, you're either going to make it into jerky, which is fine. I've had, I've had lean whitefish jerky and that's okay. Or you're going to essentially barbecue it over a smoky fire when then it's not really smoked. It's just kind of slow cooked over. You're going to eat it hot. But if you're going to sit there and like either make it into a dip or eat it while watching, you know, the Packers beat the Vikings, um, <laughs> see what I did there? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to sit there and you, you want to flake it out. And so that's not really going to be very good with a lean mm -hmm. fish. You might convince yourself that it is, but it really is like a tr smoked trout beats smoked walleye, smoked whitefish beats both of them. Oh yeah. It's not even close. Like to me, it, my mouth is watering just thinking about having that because it was so like, darn good. 
I just smoked the, so some yellowtail that I got in Southern California. And that's another oily fish, which is, so if you've ever been to a sushi restaurant and, and if you're not, if you don't live in California, there's no way you've ever heard of yellowtail because it's just a very localized fish. They own, you can only really only catch them in, in California. However, uh, you can get hamachi in a sushi restaurant and it's the same fish. And it's usually one of the most prestigious sushi fish because it is so greasy oily. And I get it. Some people don't like it um, because I don't know. They don't like food. Maybe. I mean, it's possible. <laughs> maybe dietitians. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it is like there's there's such a world of good stuff. And I think one of the things that I've appreciated about your work is just like it encourages what I would maybe term curious eating, because when you get your hands on a, a Hank Shaw cookbook, you're not looking at you know, Italian recipes, you're looking at recipe like buck, buck, moose, how about you start off, I think early in the book saying like everyone on the planet eats deer or something um, like it. Yeah. Or something like it. And so there's all these different ways to do it. And what a cool adventure to get to kind of eat your way around the world, <laughs> um, doing it with either fish or, or big game. It is. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that fuels me. It's, it's also teaches you to be super, super humble because it takes years to become even, I hesitate to use the word expert, but it, take, it takes years to even become competent in somebody else's cuisine. Because you not only have to be able to do the mechanics of the cuisine, you have to understand why dishes exist and, and, and what makes a good this versus a, a bad this. <laughs> and that takes a lot of time. And, and so I, I, I can count on one hand, the number of cuisines that I'm, you know, competent in. So when I stretch out, like, like, for example, when I do Korean food, which is something I don't know a lot about, I test the recipe, I serve it to Koreans. I ask the, my Korean, I mean, I'm in California. I mean, I have lots of Korean friends. So like you, you can, you give it to the, to people of the group who might know that, the, oh no, that you've, you messed up this way. <laughs> so that those are kind of the some of the most fraught uh, recipes in the cookbooks are the ones are the where I know it's a really good recipe, but it's out of my comfort zone as a cook. So those are extra tested so that a I want to honor the culture, and b uh, I just mechanically want to get it right so that you can get it right. And I all you know I also want to make sure that somebody who lives in a small town in Wyoming can make something reasonably kind of sort of like it in their own supermarket. So you have to then figure out what are the yeah, you, know, you want to be able to tell, make the recipe in this case, how someone in Koreatown in Los Angeles would make it. And then you want to give enough substitutes. So you have to know the ingredients really well to be able to say, well, if you can't get this, use that and make sure that that is at least reasonably available in a, in a local supermarket, because not everybody really, <laughs> it's the other thing you learn, not everybody has Amazon Prime. So truly the the universe is available on on Amazon now, which is kind of a great boon to cooks. But I have a friend who lives in rural Montana, and Prime for her is six days. <laughs> Yikes! She's kind of out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's... Lived 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 in that kind of past the edge of nowhere Montana for a while. But <laughs> very true. It's pretty remote, like a suburb of Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Seth and I were talking before the show about. Just some, just some basic things that everybody should have on hand. Seth, did you want to talk about that? Like, you know, tools of the trade and things of that nature? Yeah. So, you know, obviously if you're, if you're someone who wants to move past just throwing the venison in with the can of uh, cream of mushroom soup in the crock pot, oh, um, which is <laughs> horror. I think that's so funny that that's kind of the, the trope dish, right? But if you want to move past that, what are the, what are the tools you absolutely need to make sure you have on hand invest in because there's all sorts of things that you don't need. You need a sharp knife. I mean, a sharp, I mean, and I say this and it's not flippant because I can't tell you how many kitchens I've walked into and the, their main knife is, is so dull. Like, you know, I can use it as a hammer, but <laughs> yeah. So having a sharp knife and if you don't have a sharp knife, figure out how to make your knife sharp, whether you call up your local professional knife sharpener, most towns have one. Uh, or you buy an electric knife sharpener, or if you are already a good knife sharpener, buy Japanese water stones, which in my opinion are the best, a sharp knife, because you will cut yourself with a dull knife more than you will cut yourself with a sharp knife. So that's number one. I prefer wooden cutting boards. 
because wooden cutting boards are A, nicer to your knife, and B, they are naturally antibacterial because the lignin in mm-hmm. the wood is antibacterial. So you're, they've done all kinds of tests. They've tested wooden versus, uh, oh, by the way, if you have a glass cutting board out there, throw it in the garbage right now. Just put this on pause, go to the trash and <laughs> throw it. It is the worst thing. Like it's, one, um, it's in the top 10 worst things ever made by human beings. You know, the atomic bomb is probably up there. Um, but glass the atomic bombs and glass cutting oh boards. Get rid of them both. Just throw them out. Um, like how to destroy a knife in 13 seconds. So, but plastic is the other one that people use. And, and the reason why in the industry, we use those white plastic uh, cutting boards is because you can throw them in a, um, in a sanitizer and use them over and over and over and over again. And, and yes, if you have a sanitizer, those plastic ones are better than wood, but if you're just a person, wood's better. So sharp knife, wood cutting board, um, good pans. You don't need many. I think I have lots of pans, but I think I tend to use four really very, very like on a weekly, on a almost daily basis. I've got a, a two or a three quart pot with a lid. So it's kind of a medium pot, um, a regular frying pan, you know, I don't even know how many inches it is, but it's, you know, frying pan size, a, a, a kind of a Dutch oven, like an enameled soup, uh, soup pot, and then a stock pot, which is a long stock pot with a heavy bottom and, and high rims. So those four things will you will take you a long, long way. Buy the best you can afford. Stainless steel is your best bet, except for the, the enamel Dutch oven, in which case the enamel Dutch oven is your best bet. For me, a fine mesh strainer. With the cooking I do, I use a fine mesh strainer every single day for something. I'm either washing rice or I'm straining a sauce or I'm making a stock or, or it's just a thousand, thousand, thousand uses. Like, a, you know, if you're making a, a smooth salsa and you don't want seeds in it because seeds give you <laughs> Johnny Cash's ring of fire was written about a bad salsa <laughs> <laughs> and that is primarily caused by, by seeds and skins. So you use the sieve to get rid of those. So yeah, so it's a fine mesh sieve is another one. I do really like, I have a little paring knife. I just bought it at a flea market in France. You don't need a fancy one, but like a, a good chef's knife and a good little knife, you know, that stuff will get you a long way. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that are, that are useful and fun, but you know, I mean, a grill of some sort, I mean, whether it's a Weber or something fancy, but I prefer charcoal and I prefer small. I mean, it's, unless you have a big family, of course, but if you, if it's just you and, and you're in, and, and you're significant other, and maybe a kid or two, you will find yourself using a, a hibachi that only needs the amount of charcoal in the chimney starter way more than you will find yourself using um, something that is, that is more, that is larger because it's just fast. You can do it on a Wednesday. And if you can grill on a Wednesday and you can grill charcoal on a Wednesday, your life is better. That's perfect. And I, I hadn't thought about the wood cutting board thing, but it makes sense now. It's like, well, the plastic ones, you know, you got to put it through the sanitizer every so often, right? In the in the kitchen. So that makes sense. You wouldn't want to do that to a wood cutting board because you'd destroy it. Right. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by the bow spider. If you haven't heard of the bow spider yet, you'll have to go to bowspider.com and see what it's all about. If you're a bow hunter and you want to go hands free in the field, you really need a bow spider packing system. Out here in the West, we cover a lot of miles and it's good to be able to put your bow on your back or on your side and get a little break from toting it around the field. The bow spider packing system has a lot of different options. You can use it in tree stands. You can use it on the headrest of your truck to transport your bow. You can put it on your pack and carry it around on your back. You can also put it on your side. So if you haven't checked it out, go to bowspider.com and check out the bow spider. You can also go to YouTube and type in bow spider and go to their channel. They have how to videos to show you exactly how to use their products. Again, you can check out the Bow Spider by going to bowspider.com. Again, that's bowspider.com. Now back to the show. Uh, I guess the and uh, maybe like the uh, the companion to that last question for me is like so for you that same thing you got your you got your four your four pans, your sharp knife, you've thrown away your glass cutting board <laughs> <laughs> and all your atomic arsenal and you're ready to, you're ready to go. Uh, like kind of like the thing, the picture in my mind is like, what does the training montage then look like? Like what are the skills that are kind of requisite for just taking a next step in cookery? Because obviously there's a lot of, 
you know, there's a lot of fancy things you can do, but are there certain things that you should just invest the time in learning how to do, whether it's like go out and catch a bunch of crappie and flay them so that you get better with your cutting or just that kind of thing. Like what does the, what's the training montage look like for becoming better in the kitchen? Um, I'm going to leave out the filleting stuff cause that's not in the kitchen. Sure. But yes, yes, that. Um, so learn how to, I mean, if I, if I see another highfalutin chef on iron chef or top chef mishandle a fish again, I'm going to, I'm going to need another television. <laughs> it just drives me batty. Learn how to cook a fish, learn how to cook a duck breast, learn how to cook backstrap. Those are one, two, three. You cook a duck breast. I mean, I have tutorials on, on my website and on my books and all this stuff, but these are bedrock skills. If you can cook a duck breast or a goose breast, skin on or skin off, that is a huge step in making everyone in your life enjoy duck. If you can cook a, a backstrap, and, 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 and here's the thing, here's a, here's a caveat tip to that. When you kill a deer or an antelope, don't cut steaks for crying out loud. Cut lengths of backstrap, typically about a foot long, and, and vacuum seal those. Because what happens is you, then you cook this the cylinder of backstrap, which is way easier to cook properly than these tiny little steaks. And, and by the way, who steaks, if you do cut steaks, steaks are a minimum of two fingers wide. This is America. And, <laughs> and <laughs> don't make them like, so skinny. Yeah. Don't make me come to your house. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to throw my, one of my brothers under the bus just yeah. <laughs> a little bit. But this was, he's, he's become better, but like he would but, do butterfly steaks. And I don't know if they were a full finger why but he's like getting all the he could get a lot of steaks out of you know a roast or something just kill more deer <laughs> they were really difficult to like when you say cook properly too i'm not sure what people are thinking but Medium yeah rare. to get it to get it where it's not a dried out piece of Chalk. you know basically venison toast yeah. um it's really difficult yeah, unless I, you have it <clears throat> in a roast that was a real eye opener um I mean, books. you want it medium rare. You want your duck breast medium rare as well. Or medium's fine, but but whale is not in either of these cases. Um, how to sear a fish. So, you know, how to fry a fish, crying out loud. Like you, you'd think, I used to take that for granted. And then uh, when Hook, Line, and Supper came out, I would do these demos all over the country. And people were like, oh, that's amazing. I'm like, yeah, the, the oil is 350. So, the thing home cooks get super freaked out by high heat. Like so home cooks lose their, lose their mind. If the, the thermometer hits 360. when their oil that they have in there is a, has a 400 smoke point. You're fine. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got 40 extra degrees. And even then that's only the smoke point. That's not the ignition point. So there's that. Um, that's the single biggest problem with frying is that, is that the oil's too cool. The second biggest problem with frying is that they overstuff the fryer. So everything steams on itself and you've dropped the oil temperature to the point where you're, you, it's no longer 360. So learn how to fry, you know, your old uncle Joe, who knows how to fry fish, like a, like a champ when I guarantee you when he dies and you're at his funeral, you'd be like, that guy could fry fish <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's an art and it's, it's it not everybody can do it. Uh, yes, it is. You know, the, but it's a, it's a bedrock skill that any cook should have searing a fish. It's a little bit less of a freshwater deal um, because you usually sear really nice pieces that are about a, usually about two fingers thick, which is not that common in freshwater fish, but still that's another skill to learn how to make stock. You know, all these things that we kill, you know, I have, I, I don't know how many quarts of pressure can stock I have in my pantry, but the idea of being able to pull a quart of pressure can squirrel stock from your pantry is kind of awesome. Just learn how to make stock. It's not hard. And then caveat to that, learn how to pressure can also not hard. Well, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like the kind of the direction I've been moving for the last decade or so is trying to utilize more of my, you know, catch, you know, harvest, whatever it is. And I've started making different kinds of stocks that I would have never made like walleye stock, you know, taking fish heads and bones and boiling them up or, you know, bones from the pigs that we raised or beef bones, even, you know, from a side of beef and venison bones. And like, people are like, man, you, you guys are crazy. Like you're going way far. And I'm like, have you tried this stuff? Cause I mean, it's yeah. so good. And I don't know about anybody else out there, but, it's not cheap to buy stock too. Like if you're buying a whole bunch of stock to make a recipe, it's like, man, you could have just 
made that at your house, you know, after you had your steaks, you know, let's say you had ribeyes or something, you mm-hmm. can keep those rib bones and make stock. I just did it to, you know, today. It's like that kind of stuff I think we need to get back to as a society and utilizing more of what we have. Cause we have a lot more than we think we do. A hundred percent. And it's so I mean, good. I mean, just to take your ribeye example. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk trash about some of my clients, but I'm not going to name them. <laughs> Uh, I got hired to, uh, cook for some, uh, high rollers at an event and they wanted tomahawk steaks. So they all wanted tomahawk steaks. Like each one wanted a tomahawk steak. So I don't know if you know how much tomahawk ribeyes are, but this was $900 worth of steak. Jeez. And, and so we cooked them. We did them. They were beautiful. We smoked them. We reverse seared them. So we, we, we got them almost to temp in the smoker and then we finished them on the grill. They were amazing. Well, you know, one guy ate his whole tomahawk and he was this enormous dude and good for him. Great. So virtually everybody else couldn't eat, couldn't finish them all. So number one, we trimmed a lot of the fat off these tomahawks before it ever hit the, before it ever hit the the smoker. So I used that trim to grind with venison for my ground venison. So number one, number two. They didn't, they, you know, for the, uh, really with all of them, even the people who, the one guy who did finish it, we kept all the bones and we made stock out of the ribeye bones. Smoked ribeye bone stock is mm. not Ooh, a bad thing. That sounds so good. <laughs> then I took all of the excess fat that we had cooked that they didn't eat and I rendered it. So I basically chopped it up small and let it boil in itself, which of course sterilizes it. Mm-hmm. And, and what was left was a huge amount of, of beef lard and cracklins, which I put Tahin, which if you're familiar with, it's a, it's a Mexican, it's a Mexican mixture of like powdered lime and chili. And it's amazing. Um, and they put it on everything and it's putting it on cracklins is even more amazing. And they ate all of those. And then (laughs) there was a whole bunch of like leftover meat that was like untouched by anybody. So we put that back on the grill the next day and chopped it up for carne asada tacos. So we ended up (laughs) eating it three times and, and not for nothing smoked beef fat in in flour tortillas like because flour tortillas are made with fat mm-hmm. using smoked beef fat as the fat for flour tortillas might be deathbed <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny you brought that up because we just started making our own tortillas and we were using lard from our pigs that we had Perfect. rendered ourselves and it's so much better than anything you could buy at the store i'm like so you gotta keep better. this a secret <laughs> this is so good Oh my gosh. I can't even imagine with smoked beef fat that. Oh it, man. It's just, it's wrong. It should be, a, it should be, I think, I believe it is that criminal in 14 States, but wow. <laughs> I'm just imagining it and like, holy smokes, I got to do this. <laughs> and, then you, and then you serve carne asada grilled over wood on that tortilla. Oh, man. That's basically instant Sonora. <laughs> so Seth and I are going to come visit and <laughs> it shows how to do this, man. That sounds really good. Well, is there anything that we, uh, we didn't cover that you're just dying to, to cover Hank? Um, obviously people can find you. We've mentioned a number of the different places. I believe they should have, if anyone's a deer hunter or, you know, big game hunter, they should have a copy of buck, buck moose and they should, go through it and tab it before hunting season so that when they go to break down their animal, they know, they know what they're going to make. Um, that, and they should buy it for their friends too. That's, that's like, I that's my it. opinion, but is there anything that you, that you want to really cover or, um, any projects that you want people to be aware of? Yeah, there's a couple um, actually. Uh, one is dovetails are exactly what you just said. Um, before we went on the air, I am working furiously on a, uh, a shooting outline for an online course I am filming um, in a couple weeks. And it's basically, if you imagine Buck Buck Moose as a video course, that's what this is going to be. So, so that I would know how to pronounce everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't have all of the recipes, but it's, it's a technique driven course that basically starts with you know, quarters of an animal. And it takes you through some of the butchering process, through some of the basic things like what we've talked about with stock and, and slow cooking and, and smoking and, and searing and all of that stuff. And, and it's going to be really cool. And at that we're expecting that to be released in the fall. I'll let you know. Cool. Um, and, you know, circling back to the, 
that question you asked me about my evolution as a writer, my partner and I, Holly Heiser, we've started, do you remember when blogs were blogs? Like when people actually wrote in blogs? Yep. Well, we've kind of thrown back to that on a, a website called To The Bone. It's a Substack, Uh And it's, so To The Bone is, it's a, it's a series of articles, essays. Some of them are research-based. Some of them are just think pieces. Some of them are travelogues. Like I wrote about like this funky trip to Baja. Um, I wrote about eating weird insects in, in Monterrey, Mexico. And, and so it's, it's chance to write, to actually write, to not just do recipes. Basically to the bone is everything except the recipes. And mm. it comes out every week and there's both free and paid subscription options, but you can subscribe for free. And, and then if you like it and you want to help a guy out, you can, you can subscribe and I don't, I'm, I'm not going to die if you don't, but it, it's always nice. <laughs> and then as, as you mentioned, I do the podcast, which is Hunt, Gather, Talk. And those are those are set in seasons. So we're currently in the fish and seafood season. And the books tend to be a, uh, a rough mirror of the books that I've written. So that one goes with Hook, Line, and Supper, where the previous one went with Pheasant, Quail, Cottontail, which if you guys are small game hunters, you know, like grouse or turkeys or or squirrels or rabbits and thing that's that's that book for you and so i believe you even have a possum recipe in there i we snuck one in actually <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome we did so I it's mean, just I, a joy to see the icon next the to the icon like, oh, this is what so to do much with, fun this is what to do with a possum i've always wondered <laughs> so so that book pheasant quail cottontail um because there's so many like People will be like, is that a turkey recipe? I'm like, well, yes, but I mean, you could you can use these seven other things in, in that same recipe and it'll work fine. So we created a series of little icons to show you if you have that animal and you want to do this recipe, will it work or not at a glance? And so when the artist was making the icons, I'm like, how hard would it for you to make a little icon of a beaver or a possum? And she's like, <laughs> so, so we snuck them in here and there, but it actually, it's, it's not just a joke. I mean, they actually, those recipes would work with those animals. But. Yeah. And I would just encourage everyone. His podcast is amazing. I, I've really enjoyed, I've been just listening to hours and hours of it recently. Cause it's all stuff that as like, especially right now with it being fishing related, I'm eating it up as an angler. So talk about, catch and release myths and some of the other mm. things too, which I'm very passionate about and I agree with you hundred percent. And there's a lot of good material there. So if anyone hasn't listened to that, I encourage you to go out and listen to that podcast. It's definitely worth the time. And, and listen to it on your way to your next, on your next fishing trip. That's what I did on Saturday. Yep, yep. Like lo- load it up and listen to it on the way to the water. It's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we try to keep it tight and on point and, so, I mean, some podcasts out there, uh, not this one, actually, we've been actually pretty, pretty steady, but some podcasts I've been on or that I've listened to kind of go all over the place. Mm-hmm. And um, I find it a little bit more difficult to read or to listen to. And so we, um, we try to say like, this is an entire podcast about, you know, catfish or about rough fish or about catch mm-hmm. and release. And so like, we might have a story that is off topic one or two, but really the, the whole hour, hour and 15 minutes is about that topic too, so that we can, we can kind of give you news that you can use. And it's excellent. Yeah, And, and you're, and you obviously have a great depth of knowledge and the people that you have kind of curated who you bring on are people who know what they're talking about for sure. Yeah. yeah I mean, the goal is always to learn something. And I'm actually right in the middle of the one on fish intelligence and that one. I'm very interested. I in love that so. episode. Yeah. I love that episode. Cause you, I mean, so not to get too far away, but, <laughs> but um, this guy is, he's an Australian and he's the mm. world's leading authority on fish intelligence. And I just like, I was just blown away by this episode and, and, and I don't know. I was just, it's fun to be able to talk to people like that. Yeah. And the thing that blew me away, he said that fish can recognize people's faces. I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty incredible right there. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're a lot smarter than we give them credit. So that last, like that, that bass that you caught's last face was like, I never liked you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. And I just want to say how grateful I am that you came on the show. I mean, I know you, you've got lots of other things going on. And the fact that you took some time to spend with us just means a whole lot to me. And I know to Seth as well. So thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. No, it's been fun. It's been, uh, let me know. Let me know when this uh, airs and I will. Uh, I'll share it on that series of tubes we call the internet. That sounds amazing. excellent. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm uh, going to go get back to work and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yep. Have a great night. You too. Yeah. All right. See ya. Bye. All right. 
Well, we just wrapped up with Hank Shaw, award-winning author. That was quite the conversation. Like I, I feel like I got a ton out of that, Seth. I mean, that was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I, it's fun to, to actually get to hear someone that, you know, like you're familiar with, like either for the podcast and like get to ask your question. So that was a really, a huge treat for me personally. And there's just some things that it's so easy to forget to bleed your fish. It's such a simple thing, but like to be reminded of like, oh, that's, that's what I can do if I really am serious about harvesting and treating that, that resource with some respect and having something that I can really, truly enjoy when I get home. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, my wife and I, it's like Victoria and I love the fact that we get to eat like kings because of things like that, just taking better care of stuff in the field. And you've really put a lot of the recipes to use. Um, and you talked about a few of them on the podcast, but why don't you talk about a few of the other ones that you've done that you really like? So I think the the number one, and we definitely did talk about this one in the podcast because he, as he said, like people misinterpret how many chipotles you should put in the barbacoa. <laughs> um, but the barbacoa recipe is one that's really special to me because as I mentioned like that memory of how tedious it was to try and turn shanks into into hamburger. The way my family did it, we didn't just grind things forever. We would actually remove all of that connective tissue. And it was super tedious. It's most of what I remember about butchering parties when I was a kid. Hated it. <laughs> um, and the front shoulder and the neck too. And some of that meat, sad to say, like we would get a lot of it, but a lot of that stuff ended up as magpie food because of, you know, kind of the yield we would get once you actually, once you get rid of the silver, the, that connective tissue, the silver skin, you've lost so much that you don't end up with very much. But boy, if you slow cook it and that, that barbacoa is just a really savory, delicious recipe, but all of that connective tissue that we were getting working so hard to get rid of melts in and just gives the meat a really rich, like almost buttery texture. And not only is it something you want to leave in, it, you want to leave it in because it adds so much. So do that with all of the shanks from deer, the front shoulders from small deer and the necks. That's what we do with it and absolutely love it because it's one of those dishes that we can like set it to go in the morning, you go off to work. And even on a weekday, you've got an amazing meal when you come home after work. So that's one that's really special to us. Yeah. My mouth's watering thinking about that because it is really good. It's, it's nice to be able to set something up in the morning and come home and have a nice meal, especially when you've had a long day. Um, but I thought it was really, it was just kind of fun to pick his brain on, you know, just, uh, some of the utensils, some of the things that are kind of a must have in the kitchen, you know, some basics. Um, and they all make a lot of sense. You know, when you start to zoom out and think about it, it's like, yeah, it makes sense that you need all those different things, especially if you're going to make, you know, a barbacoa, you're going to make, uh, you know, maybe a stock later or something like that, mm -hmm. having all those different things. And then of course about the wooden cutting board and the sharp knife, which a lot of people overlook in many areas, uh, whether it be fish filleting or, you know, just proper <laughs> care for, you know, cutting up your, your meal and what you're going to prepare. So, um, I really enjoyed that. Uh, that was, that was pretty fun. And of course, you know, saying you had to get rid of your glass cutting boards, like your atomic bombs, that was pretty entertaining too. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the thing that's been a kind of an eye opening is, you know, I, I grew up not doing a lot of the cooking, you know, as a, as a kid and a teenager and didn't start becoming more serious about cooking until I was a single guy in my late twenties. Right. Um, and no one else was making food and I wanted to eat something a little better. Started getting a little more serious about <laughs> not eating ramen or uh, spaghetti noodles all the time. Right. Right. Um, but you kind of have this idea that you need all this fancy equipment or you need to know fancy techniques and there's certainly a lot of room to grow, but just what he talked about, it doesn't actually take having that much, even if you don't have a huge budget or like in my place, we have a tiny kitchen, Well, you have room for four pots and eight and two sharp knives 
and a cutting board. You don't need, you know, on the mesh strainer, and he mentioned some other things too, but it's really a pretty short list of things where you can get started and you can have super, super high quality food, stuff that you can enjoy and share with friends. I think that's a big part of it for me is you can have something that you don't have to apologize or make excuses for. You can say, I'm going to, I'm going to treat you to something special because I love you Mm -hmm. have some of this. Um, I really love that, that it's that simple to get started. I think another thing that just highlight in that too, is in my family, we did basically two things with a deer that I can remember, maybe three, we would do some jerky, maybe, but everything else was steak and hamburger. That's what we did. We cut it into steaks. We cut it into hamburger. I, I may be misremembering because what do you know when you're when you're a kid, we may have done some roasts, but that was the majority of it. And that's really eye-opening that with venison, because of the lower fat content, you do not want to cut it into steaks first. You want to cook it in a roast. And even if you're going to eat it as a steak, cook it in a roast, then cut it into steaks. That's a game changer. Yeah. I think that that's, that's huge. Just because, you know, you and I've talked about this before, you have only so much of that animal to go around. And so the decisions you make during the processing stage have long lasting implications on how you're going to eat that meat. And I I do agree. Like just I growing up, we butterfly staked everything or grounded or, or whatever. And I do a lot more roasts now because I like slow cooking it and having all that connective tissue just kind of melt in tastes so much better to me. Um, I like to pull it apart make tacos, make whatever I want. Right. Like Mm -hmm. it's just, it's just so much better that way. But I thought the other thing that was kind of fun that we talked about is utilization because I I think that's one of the things that we miss out on quite a bit is there's a lot more to an animal than we give it credit for. And it's best to utilize as much of that animal as possible. And Hank Shaw has some amazing pieces in his books and sections on making stock and utilizing as much of that as you possibly can. You know, we talked about tripe. We talked about a lot of things. Um, I think it's, I think it's important. And I think it's a lost skill. It's, it's something that, you know, my grandma, she used to make, you know, stock and pressure can it and throw it in the cupboard, you know, or there were lots of different things that she did, but I mean, she grew up during the great depression, so it's not really a huge surprise. But you ask somebody nowadays, you know, our age, most people have no clue how to can, let alone pressure can or any of this. Like they, it's, yeah, you're definitely the exception to the rule for for guys, particularly. Like, um, I have to fall into that category, that guilty category of people who don't know how to can. But you could make stock, right? Like you could take a crock pot and you can throw in some bones and some seasonings and um, some water. And you could cook it for 12 yeah. hours, right? Like that's not mm-hmm. that difficult. Like even It's not if, hard, yeah. Yeah, it's not difficult. Now, you know, you have to get some extra equipment maybe to pressure can or to can it, but the actual making of the stock is not that difficult. But how many people do it? I mean, it's, it's a very small <laughs> percentage of people actually take and make stock. And man, dude, he had my mind swimming when he was talking about making tortillas <laughs> with some smoked beef fat. I'm going to have to try that. That sounded really good, but it was just a great conversation with a great guy. You know, I, I feel like I've learned a little bit obviously, and I just want to check out more of his recipes at this point. Yeah. I, I've looked like part of the problem for me in trying new, new recipes out of some of the books is when you find a number that you love as much as you do, Once you've tried 16, 17 different recipes, you kind of want to have those again. And it's like hard to keep on branching out, but I'm, I'm always, almost always glad that, uh, that I did. I think the only thing I've had one time that I made a hang shaw recipe and I wasn't, I wasn't in love with what I did and it was me. I didn't do a good job. (laughs) I'm pretty sure like I try that again and it wasn't the flavors of the combinations, but I've done so much stuff that is good that like, I'm still looking forward to trying new things. We just, uh, Victoria and I were looking at the cookbook and saw the Ethiopian Tibbs recipe, which is, 
Um, it involves cooking venison and spiced butter and oh my gosh, I don't know how I haven't tried that yet. So, uh, it's funny, like one of the things that, you know, I, I, I think it's come through pretty clear in the podcast that I'm a huge fan and that I can't <laughs> give a high enough recommendation to get the hands on the book. But, you know, I even had, I had a dentist working on my fill in a cavity and the hygienist was talking about her boyfriend just turning the whole deer he was going to shoot into hamburger and i i was just absolutely dying because i'm like you're doing it wrong <laughs> as soon as they it. got their hands out of my mouth they're like you need to buy this book yeah. don't 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 do this don't do this horrible thing you're making you a so big mistake <laughs> you're doing it. spend spend the money get this book mm-hmm. you'll thank me later um so yeah, yeah, that was a real treat. And on the fishing side, I would just encourage people to try some different things. I mean, there's a lot more you can do with fish than just batter and fry. So um, if you want to expand your horizons and tickle your taste buds, you should check out that hook, line, and supper. And we should say it's a good read, too. Like, he yeah. is uh, not everyone who knows a lot of things and is an expert or is an excellent chef is also a good writer. But Hank Shaw kind of ticks all the boxes. He's actually a good read. He's fun to read too. So you cool. can't lose. Well, again, thank you guys for listening to this podcast. Seth, thank you for uh, filling in for David while he's out shooting at targets and selling bow spiders. But uh, it's been a true pleasure of mine to uh, co-host this with you. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And so I hope all of you have enjoyed this and I really, truly hope you go out and you check out Hank Shaw. You can Google him. You can go to his website. There's lots of different ways to find him. So until next time. Thanks again for listening to the Radcast Outdoors podcast. We hope that you've enjoyed the show. If so, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast and subscribe share, and give us a five-star rating, which really helps other people find the show. You can find all of our shows, recipes, giveaways, videos, and much more at radcastoutdoors.com. While you're there, please help support the show by purchasing a Radcast Outdoors shirt or hat. Please don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We also have a Radcast community on Facebook called Radcast Nation, and we'd love for you to join in the conversation there. And of course... Please help support our sponsors who make this show possible. Thank you again to PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Until next time, get out there and enjoy the outdoors.